Good afternoon everybody, thanks for joining today. This is just a quick sound check for my benefit, so you can ignore this and I'll see you in around 10 minutes.
Good morning or good afternoon everybody. Welcome to today's webinar which is all about editing portraits. So that's the plan for today. We've got four to five depending how long I ramble on for uh, portraits to uh, get through and uh, sorry I just need to close something otherwise we're gonna hear me twice. There we go. Sorry you're gonna hear double David otherwise. So we've got four portraits to run through, variety of different shots, some daylight, uh, some studio, and all requiring slightly different techniques so it's not too uh, repetitive either. But before we get to that, just a couple of things, uh, housekeeping things to mention. Hello to those of you on YouTube and Facebook because we're going out to three different locations at the moment. And uh, if you're in the webinar room itself, so hello to you guys as well. For those of you in the webinar room, just a couple of things uh, to note and actually for everyone else. So we've got a maximum of 60 minutes today, which is plenty for this session based on uh, what we did this morning, fingers crossed, uh, depending on my rambling, of course. If you're in the webinar room and you want to ask a question, it's better if you pop it into the Q&A tab. That just keeps it separate from the chat so that it doesn't get mixed up and then uh, it's difficult to see. There's also my buddy and colleague Diego helping us uh, in the webinar room too. So you might see some questions and colleagues on YouTube and Facebook as well. So you've got the attention of tons of people from uh, Capture One at the moment. Now in the webinar room, if you want to hide the chat and the Q&A, you can just hit that little uh, uh, collapse arrow and that will give you a bit more screen real estate as well. And for those of you on um, YouTube and Facebook, please don't be afraid to pop any comments and questions that you have in there as well. So this is what we're gonna look at today. So a couple of studio shots or two or three studio shots, a couple of daylight shots. Uh, we might not get to all of them, but there's a good mix of different kind of variety and skills and uh, photos all donated from our community as well. And I'll give those people who offered these photos up for a, a try in these webinars as we go along as well. Okay, so I think I'm gonna start with we're gonna grab one from Emily, Emily T, great photographer based out of Brooklyn in New York. Uh, so this is the shot as it came out of camera and I think this was this morning's effort. Uh, now it's very rare I actually managed to get everything to match. That was the day before I think. So let's see how we go with um, uh, trying out a couple of different uh, edits and see how close we get. Uh, but this is a nice example of you know, using layers, I won't use the skin tone tool on this one. That's gonna come up with our surfer dude, this guy, because this is a really good exercise in uh, using the skin tone tool and a few other bits as well. Then we've got more of an editorial portrait shot, also from Emily. And then a few others you can see on the top row, which we can try and get to as well. So that's the plan. All right, let's start with uh, Emily's shot. So I'm gonna grab our crop tool first of all and just go in a little bit uh, tighter so something like that now there is a slight blemish up in the corner of the background and there's actually a scratch i can see here so we get rid of that uh, at the end just using uh, the healing clone tools as well now what i want to do with this shot is kind of a little bit more high key a little bit brighter and maybe a slightly cool tone. We had a sort of fight two camps this morning whether it should look better cold or warm, but the good news is uh, you can go either way. So first of all, I wanna bring up the brightness a bit. And the reason why I say brightness uh, is that I don't wanna bring up the exposure because the darker tones like her hair, I wanna kinda of keep them a bit richer and a bit darker. And using the brightness is just gonna lift the skin tones a little bit more with less of an effect in the shadows. And you'll see us do that a few times uh, with some of the shots as, as well. So exposure will lift everything by the same amount. Uh, brightness is gonna kind of affect uh, the mid-tones a little bit more. Now white balance wise, I might just call it off a tiny touch as well, not by much. And then we can always also look at color grading at the end to see either way that we can push it. So that's the first step, looking at the levels, just gonna hit auto on the levels, that will just give us a good setting of the endpoints, which will remove any flatness and give us a little bit of contrast. Now that already looks pretty nice out of camera, but what I thought would be good on this shot, um, it's beautifully sharp, nice and in focus and so on. 
Um, with some other shots, we're going to go for uh, increasing the clarity slider. So that's this guy over here. But on this particular shot, we can actually drop the clarity down a bit. So if we take it sort of to around 30 points. Now, it might be hard to see what's going on on a webinar transmission. Now, just looking at it here, it doesn't look like there's much of a loss of sharpness or anything like that. It just takes the edge off it a tiny bit. So if I click on the clarity slider and hold, then you can see before and after, or maybe easier if we bring up our before and after slider, you can see it's just softened it a little bit, like in the skin texture and so on. But it doesn't make it look blurry or you know unpleasant or anything like that. It just gives it a nice uh, glowy feel. One thing thinking about this for color grading, I wouldn't mind the background just to kind of cool off a little bit more. So looking at our curves, if we pick the blue curve, if I hold the um, cursor tool just on the background, you can see a little orange line dance around uh, on the histogram itself. So you can see that her skin tone and the background are just kind of on this peak. So if I give this a big nudge, you can see obviously the effect that's gonna have that's not desirable but I just want to kind of take it a tiny bit just into the cooler space like so. So nothing drastic, but just um, a little bit of uh, a tint like so. Um, now we can always um, um, modify that in, in actual fact. If you want to do a little tiny little bit, then you can also bring the curve tool out and make it a bit larger and that gives you kind of finer control as well so that will obviously be a lot but i just want to give it a little tiny barely imperceptible nudge like so okay let's pop the curves tool back don't often use that in the different color channels but it's nice every now and then so how far have we got if we bring up before and after you can see what's going on uh, a couple of things i want to do is maybe treat the hair separately because everything like face wise and her skin tone looks kind of you know nice um, but I wouldn't mind making the hair a bit stronger so we can deal with that on a separate layer so let's make a new layer and we're going to call this hair it's good to name your layers so you don't forget what's going on grabbing our brush right click to get our brush settings up and we're going to go flow to 100% if you don't know what flow does don't worry about that right now uh, hold that thought because we're going to mess around with flow quite extensively on the next edit. So if we press M to see our mask, we're going to do a pretty sort of quick rough mask on her hair. Doesn't have to be massively accurate. Could probably be a bit better than that though, David. So I'm just going to grab the eraser and make this a bit bigger and just take out my little overspill there so we're not doing anything super accurate so it doesn't have to be a blindingly accurate mask so what i want to do i love her her hair color and we kind of lost that a little bit with the tweaks we've made so far so what i would like to do is chuck in a bit more contrast so it's a bit glowier and richer and that will increase the saturation a tiny bit the contrast slider or when you add contrast especially with a curve uh, on rgb the contrast will go up a fair bit. If you use the contrast slider, the increase in saturation is moderated a little bit, so it won't go off the charts. Now I wanna push this a little bit harder, but now you can see in the darker tones, we're losing a bit of definition. So to counteract that, we can just bring up the black slider a little bit, not by a huge amount, but just so we can see the detail going in there. And I might kick in a bit more saturation too. So if we turn this layer off and on, then it's subtle change, but it's got you know a bit more sheen there and a bit more contrast and so on. Once again, let's have a look at before and after, and we can see kind of what's going on like so. Now, as I mentioned, we've got a bit of a wrinkle in the top left-hand corner. Now, previously in Capture 120, that would be a job uh, for Photoshop, which is, uh, would be kind of annoying but now we can grab our uh, healing brush i'm going to make this a bit bigger and just do a sort of generic splat over here and then capture one will pick a point which is actually about 
looks pretty seamless, doesn't it? Uh, and there's a scratch on the background here. So let's get rid of that as well, because that's going to bug me. So we can just follow the line like so. It's also pretty good. And her skin is actually pretty. I mean, I have to go to 200% before we see anything. But if we want to do a little bit of spotting, then we can do so as well. Now, um, one of the shots, actually, I mean, out of all the shots, everyone's got pretty amazing skin so it doesn't require a huge amount of spotting and it'd be pretty boring for you to sit here and watch me dust and spot but you get the idea with capture one's new healing tool it's pretty easy just to select it over here capture one will automatically make me a new heal layer and then i can just go ahead and then get rid of any sort of marks that i want but as i said her skin's pretty outstanding so we don't really need to do a great deal but for removing that background kink that worked really nicely if we turn this layer off and back on and that scratch in the background that's you know a really good use uh, for that all right um let's have a look at any questions that have popped up uh, we've got andre and diego helping out as well so if some mystery person does answer your question uh that's way uh, dodging and burning, I saw Shubanka was asking. Um, yes, we will do a little bit of dodging and burning, I think. Yes, we will, actually. But there's several different ways to do it, and there's not just like a dodge and burn tool. It's essentially creating a layer and then deciding what tools would make sense to do your dodge and burn or whatever. Um, just looking at other questions. Hello everyone from Poland. Hi Poland. Um, what's the point of creating a heel layer? Steve was asking if you can't use the tool on a regular layer. Um, it keeps it separate Steve. So this heel layer, if I press M, you can see where all my healing points are. That keeps it as an entirely separate layer. Now you're probably thinking, but what if I want to change density or something like that? The healing will always kind of match any change. So if we go to the background and just mess around with exposure, healing follows with it. So it's not like you get a whole bunch of spots suddenly appear that you have to redo. So different to Photoshop in, in a big way. So Steve, don't feel that, that there's anything missing. Um, it's kind of very useful to have the healing on a separate layer. Now, healing points will be unlimited. So you might ask, what's the point of having more than one heal layer? Sometimes it's nice if you want to moderate the opacity of a heal layer. So if I wanted to remove this spot under her eye, I could heal it, but then bring the opacity back a little bit. Now, her eye looks perfectly normal, so I wouldn't do that. But on someone like me with light bags under their eyes, that could be uh, a technique. Um, a couple of you asked about uh, if you've cropped the image, sometimes a healing point can dance outside of the crop, which is true, uh, which I agree is quite uh, frustrating. So if you are going to do a lot of healing, either save your cropping to the end, or if you need to, just uh, reset your crop, do your healing, and then th throw your crop back on. But I know that's, that's a bit of a, a frustration, but there's not um, a way around it currently. Uh, you can delete the healing tool effect with the razor, uh, Omar was asking. So a couple of different ways to get rid of a healing point. So you can either just select it, tap once and it turns orange and press backspace on your keyboard and that will get rid of the healing point. Um, or you can actually use the eraser to erase parts of the mask as well. Okay, just looking over on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks for helping out there. Um, is there a quick key to adjust the healing brush without holding, hiding the healing part of the menu? Uh, there is a quick way to adjust the brush. You can use your square bracket keys or you can use shift square bracket to change hardness or you can change that to anything you like. So if you go to the edit menu and edit keyboard shortcuts and just type in heal, for example, uh, you can see draw healing mask. If we type in brush, then we've got brush size, hardness, and so on and so forth. So you can just add a shortcut key to whatever you choose for those. Cool, alrighty. 
Let's see. Um, now remember, if you're in the webinar room, put your questions in the Q&A tab because they'll probably get missed uh, in the chat. All right, um, let's go. So let's see what we ended up with on Emily's lovely shot. So we had, this is how we ended up with it. If we put on before and after, nice subtle edits, uh, just a little lift of brightness. So not to bring up the shadows too much fixed our crinkly background and our split on our background and did a separate layer just for the hair which bumped up the contrast a little bit so that was this layer here as you can see whether it matches what we did this morning <laughs> and yesterday is probably highly unlikely so that's a little bit warmer i think that was yesterday and this was this morning that's kind of somewhere in between the two so you can vote whether you prefer it warm or cold but you can go either way of course Okay, um, let's go to the next shot um, and see where we can go. All right, so let's take this guy now because this is interesting because now we can dig into the skin tone tool a little bit. Uh, that's the edit that we did earlier today and this is as it is out of camera. This is a shot from Russell Ord in Australia of Nev by the looks of it. So Russell uh, shoots with Fuji and this is on a GFX 100. So when we zoom to 100%, we're gonna get blistering resolutions. <laughs> I'll probably have to zoom out a bit when we're working on this shot, just so you can see what's going on. But this shot is uh, really useful uh, for seeing how the skin tone tool works because like all of us, especially me, uh, we have always variations in our skin tone color, especially if we don't have makeup on, of course. Makeup will often remove a lot of those variations, but there can still often be a difference between, say, skin tone on the face to skin tone on hands, other body parts, and so on. Especially if your body temperature is cold, then you'll see a difference in skin tone color hand against the face. So sometimes it's good to normalize or, or equalize those different skin tones. In the case of Nev here, uh, he's got um, like a little change in skin tone here, a little bit on his nose and some under the eyes and a little bit on his head and so on. Now the whole purpose of the skin tone tool is to use it with um, obviously respect and, and a balance to what you actually want to achieve because the skin tone tool could completely unify a skin tone so it's absolutely the same over someone's face but maybe that's not necessarily very sympathetic um, or really what we want to achieve but fortunately there's loads of ways we can moderate the impact and the effect of the skin tone tool so first of all for our boy Nev here uh, what we're going to do is I mean it's pretty good out of camera if you delivered that I'm sure you'd be delighted. So again, I'm just gonna raise up the brightness a touch. Now, if you pull the brightness a lot, you'll see it's having most of the effect kind of in the mid-tones, which is great because I like the dark background, as you can see. Uh, exposure, if we pull that up, it has a far more reaching effect into the background because it's gonna affect all the tones uh, at the same rate. So uh, let's just pull up the brightness a tiny bit and then I'm going to pull down the blacks ever so slightly and that's just going to darken the background a bit. Now in terms of dodging and burning we might do a little bit just to lift out the hairline ever so slightly but I want a bit more contrast so I'm going to bring that back down and maybe not so much brightness. Okay, now to, whoa, 100%, now to uh, the skin tone tool. Now, when we use the skin tone tool, uh, it's kind of best if you work with it on a layer, because as I said, you can decide really want where you want the effect, and you can use the opacity slider in the layers tool to moderate really its impact again. And when we create our mask, we can modify it once more so you can really build the perfect correction so first of all we're going to make a new field layer and we're going to call this skin tone now the reason why it's filled and that means essentially a mask over the whole shot so anything we do is going to affect everything now at this point the reason for doing it that is so we can dial in our adjustments to an acceptable amount and really see what it's doing. 
So let's move to the color tab and then I'm just going to collapse layers for a second so we've got more room on the skin tone tool and we're going to grab, sorry, first of all we're going to go to the skin tone tab, we're going to grab our color picker and we're going to look on Nev, it's going a bit closer, and we're going to just decide what is the target skin tone. So out of all the skin tones on his face, which is the correct for want of a better word, or which is the target skin tone that you want to adhere to. So it's not his nose because it's kind of getting to red, pink, etc. It's not down here. I'm sort of thinking somewhere around here where he's got a bit of a tan on and so on. So I'm going to click that. Now straight away we get a range which is marked in the solid line, our cheese wedge for want of a better word, and the dot in the middle that's the exact color tone that I clicked on. So that is our target skin tone. That's what we want everything to adhere to. Now the idea is in the skin tone tool, I'm just going to make this a bit wider, when we use these three sliders under uniformity, this is going to essentially take everything in this triangle, so everything in my cheese wedge or triangle, and transform it to the pick point. So it's kind of like a net, it's going to catch all those colors and then transform it to that picked point. So you'll see as I drag hue all the way across, notice now that his skin tone has become uniform. So telltale sign is his lips of course, if we go back to zero then that drains the color out of his lips like so. But it has a positive benefit on his nose and under his eyes and probably the bit down here on his neck. But I am totally with you that to have it that much would obviously look completely unnatural. So what we're going to do is dial in the hue to where we think is sort of a good compromise and we can probably go further than we think is necessary. Saturation will do the same thing, that will just even out the saturation but in this case it doesn't have much effect. Lightness we've got to be a bit careful of, that will flatten any sort of nice lighting that you've got. So lightness I'm barely going to touch and we're going to leave hue around there. Now right now that's affecting everything which we don't want because our mask was a field layer. But it allowed us to see the exact effect of uh, what the skin tone tool was going to do. So what we need to do now, or before that, if you're not happy with your target skin tone, and this will give you really an idea of what this tool is doing, you can pick up this dot and we can give Nev any sort of skin tone that we want. So we can really create any old skin tone. Uh, now as I've messed that up I'm just going to reset that and we do the exercise again. So I'm going to pick around there, let's expand this out just to catch as much as possible, bring up our hue and then just a little bit of that. So now what we want to do is right click on our layer and get rid of that mask. Now the adjustments are going to stay there, it's just the mask that's gone. So now we can grab our brush and paint in our skin tone correction I'm slouching, our skin tone correction where we need it. Now this is the important bit, let's zoom out a bit, this is where we want to introduce flow. Right now when we did our hair layer on the last photo of Emily's, um, that was flow set to 100, so that was just a big solid mask if you like, and we didn't have to be that accurate and I wanted the same effect over the whole area. Now what we want to do with uh, Nev here is that we want to bring the flow right down and that's effectively slowing the rate that the mask builds up. So if you imagine a tin of paint and this is my paintbrush, if I, let's say you're painting a wall, if you dip your paintbrush in and then you immediately go and paint the wall, it's going to run and the paint's going to be really thick and you've kind of covered everything in one brush stroke. Now if you dip your paintbrush in and then kind of wipe some of the paint off and dry it off a little bit and then paint on the wall, chances are you won't cover everything, it's going to be thinner and so on. So flow is a similar principle like how much paint do you want on your brush. So if we turn flow right down, let's say just to five, I'm going to make this a bit bigger. Now we can brush and then that will slowly brush in the effect of my skin tone correction and then I can stop when I think it looks kind of about right. 
So now if we go over to his eyes, make this a bit smaller, and then just do a, a few strokes and around here. Now it won't look like much is changing because it's going to be subtle, but you'll see it when we do a little before and after. So under here we can take that away as well and just a bit in there. And then we did his nose, chin was kind of not too bad really, but we could do a few brushes around here. And then the telltale bit, which was a bit more obvious, was kind of just under here. So I'm going to brush away like so, and then gradually that difference in color tone will fade away, as you can see. So now if we bring up, just think nose is all right. If we bring up the before and after, and then just go across, if you look at his nose, that's before, and then that's after, like so. And if you look at his eye up here, before and after as well. So it's just taking some of that color tint out. Now if we turn the skin tone layer off, then you can see before and after as well. Now the good thing is, again, if you think um, um, that you've gone too far, then you can also grab opacity and just lessen the effect as well. So you've got loads of scope with flow, you've got loads of scope with uh, the opacity and so on. Now if you really want to see what your mask is doing, if we press M, you can see the mask in red where we've painted it in. Oh, we didn't do his head, did we? So let's just do a little bit up here. Press M to hide my mask. I might bring this down a bit more. So and just even out that skin tone as well. Now there's nothing to stop you doing, you doing this across a couple of layers. So if their skin tone is varying anyway and you wanted to kind of match one area to another, then you could just do another. So skin tone face, skin tone arm, skin tone forehead, uh, or whatever. So if we turn skin tone off and back on, or we use before and after, then you can see the difference that we've made. And what I was gonna say, if you really wanna see what your mask is doing, have a look at the mask in grayscale. So over here in the layers tool, if we say uh, display grayscale mask, that will show you the mask in levels of gray. So white is where the correction is at its maximum, black is no correction, and then gray is obviously any step um, in between. So if I zoom out a bit, we can kind of see our little uh, cartoon nev there with the various changes of, of the mask. But by using it in that way, you can do a skin tone correction and um, keep some you know, subtlety or at least a bit of natural look as well. Like the, the sort of fast way to do it would be just to draw a mask of full opacity all over Neb's face here and then throw in the skin tone correction, but it doesn't give you any flexibility. So that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, we're not quite done, but let's just have a look at a couple of questions. Um, if several layers with similar masks, Bob is asking, how can you avoid inadvertently changing the mask anchor point? Well, it's based on the layer that you have selected. So even if you've got anchor points around, I don't think you can pick them up. Or, uh, that was Bob asking, I think, you can turn off the selection points. So if I say display selection points, um, it won't actually, there we go, so you can see it on his nose. Uh, but I always have that off, and then I don't find them useful or anything like that, so I just select my various different layers. Um, let's see, I won't be able to answer all your questions, I'm afraid, uh, but Andre and Diego, or sorry, Andre's doing a grand job as well. Good point about Wacom, you might have seen that I'm using a pen, and how big of a Wacom should I buy, Pedro was asking. It depends what you're doing. Uh, I think if you're an illustrator, big is best, as we say. I think if you're using Capture One, then you don't necessarily need an enormous tablet, because the bigger the tablet, the more sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? exaggerated your movements will have to be. So I have what is now classed as a medium, I would think. Uh, I can't see what, it's an older model, but I think it's roughly equivalent of a medium now, not a small. And that covers two 27 inch monitors, absolutely fine. I would not want any more resolution because I think my shoulder would start to hurt. 
so I think if you were doing drawings, big is good. Capture one, I'm sure small is fine as well. Uh, let's just check on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, Yulia's doing a great job over there. So I think she's kind of pretty much uh, covering your skin tone. This is a good question because I've seen a few of you ask that. When you select the target skin tone, is it a point or an average of multiple pixels? Uh, it's an average of pixels. Now it depends on your zoom level. So if, we, if we're zoomed out heavily, then it's not gonna use one pixel because it would dance all over the place. Uh, when you zoom in, then that range will narrow slightly again because you don't want too much of a pixel range. So based on the uh, zoom level, then it is slightly dynamic and works pretty good as well. All right, last uh, question I think we shall find. Um, Peter said, I've watched earlier webinars where you've masked the entire face first and then erased eyes and mouth. Um, you can do that, but I think the method that I showed you gives you a better end result with more flexibility. So that's what I would go with. Alrighty, so last thing we want to do with Nev here is a couple of things. Um, we want to make a kind of bump up the detail, the opposite of what we did with Emily's shot, where we kind of went negative clarity. I would like to do the opposite and do positive and get a bit more sharpness structure uh, and so on. So if we make a new layer, we're going to call this uh, details. And I'm going to use a radial mask because Nev shape is face shape is kind of pretty easy to do on here. So radial mask is this cursor here. So I'm gonna make something sort of like this and maybe feather it a bit more and so on. Now it might be a bit on the large side, but we can always dynamically adjust it. So now we've got this radial mask, but by default, it'll be on the outside and I want it on Nev's face. So I'm gonna right click and say invert mask and that will flip it around like so. So now we've got a mask just kind of sitting where I want it. But if I want to adjust it, as long as I've got the radial cursor tool selected, I can always go back in and tweak it a little bit more as well. So now I've got that, what I want to do here, the opposite of what we did to Emily's shot. So I wanna add a bit more clarity, not too much because that looks sort of like he's been out in the Australian sun too much, but a bit more clarity. And if I zoom into 100%, we can add in a little bit of structure as well. The GFX 100 can definitely take it because there's so much fine pixel detail. Structure will just add um, a little bit of definition. And I saw a question earlier, and I can't remember your name, sorry, asking what is clarity in structure? Clarity is essentially a contrast adjustment, but it's focused on the midtones. So it doesn't affect the shadows and it doesn't affect the highlights. So you can push clarity quite hard without ruining your shadows and, and highlights. Structure will enhance edge definition. So edge definition on Nev is kind of skin, pores, hairs, and all that kind of stuff. So if we whack up structure a lot, then you can see it starts to get ugly. Now, because the GFX has such fine detail and resolution, you can actually push it quite hard. Now, if we had a camera, you know, an older camera, which wasn't as sharp, structure will not help you suddenly magic magically make something sharp but it's great for just adding a little bit of extra acutance as we say so if i turn details off and back on then you can see what it's doing like so now regarding dodging and burning that popped up earlier with our um, adjustment that we did on the background with the blacks, if I click and hold on blacks, we're losing his hair a little bit. So I just kind of want to brighten just around the edge, like a bit of a bit of a halo. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Good question. So I'm going to make a new field adjustment layer. So again, that's over the whole shot. And what adjustments can we use that will just brighten up this area a bit? Now it's going to affect the whole shot, but I'm really just looking about what's going to affect this area better. So if we zoom in a touch so we can see easier, and I'm going to guess that lifting up the blacks is going to help. That's probably it really. 
and maybe brightness not so much because it's kind of centered in the darker areas so maybe the shadows a bit as well so if we turn this layer on and off you can see what that's doing to his hairline but I don't want it to be that strong I just want a little bit around the edge so again if we right click and say clear mask grab our brush nice super low flow once more and Alan said earlier oh it doesn't go to zero he thought flow could go to zero but it doesn't it goes to one so maybe that's something we fixed Alan so now with a nice low flow this is essential essentially we are dodging back in just a bit of brightness in this area so as I kind of brush around it will gradually brighten that spot but as the flow is nice and low it's subtle so now if we turn this adjustment layer off we can see before and after again if I thought you know what that's too much we could just knock this back a bit with the opacity slider okay so let's look at Nev full screen uh, let's put on before and after so as I said it was pretty good out of camera so really what we've done is just finessing what was already a nice shot so we evened up the skin tones a bit let's go into 100% ish so we can see so we evened up the skin tones a bit just around his nose and eyes really and that kind of telltale bit just under his neck so it was a bit more even and then we added our details just around the face and lifted that a bit and counteracted the sort of darkening of the background by just lifting up his hairline a little bit as well so before and after so that was a dodge not a burn but you can apply that same principle for any set of tools so on this adjustment layer which is his hair that was a bit of black and a bit of shadow so don't get stuck into the fact that dodge and burn just has to be exposure it could be any set of tools you can make yourself a sharpening brush or a noise reduction brush or anything it's perfect um, Michael was asking when would you adjust the smoothness in the skin tone panel very rarely actually so if we go to uh, let's just collapse that if we go to uh, the skin tone tool uh, am I on the right layer don't know yes um, smoothness relates to the fall off so the hard line is the range so this is our color range the smoothness relates to how it falls off into neighboring colors now by default this is 25 which gives you a really nice kind of smooth roll off um, to avoid posterization if it was set to kind of one then you might start to see kind of hard edges where differences in the skin tone that fall out of that range will then become very obvious so I would say it's very rare you even need to adjust that so don't think that's a slider you really need to attack much Michael um, let's see will this live stream be on YouTube later yes it is currently going to YouTube and being recorded as we speak so you can watch it uh, there immediately just checking Yulia is doing a great job on YouTube um, so we don't need to answer anything there really good okay uh, good point from Ravi I use curves for DMB which is a great tip uh, because you can really create the kinds of density that you want to put in so um, if on this layer instead of using these tools we would use a curve you could decide on your curve exactly what you want it to affect do you want it to affect the shadows the midtones and the highlights or do you want it to affect everything uh, it's a really nice way to dodge and burn as well so great tip from Ravi all right let's move on to the next one and let's see what's going okay um, let's bring up my browser let's just hide my tools for a second let's go to a more editorial style back to Emily hide the browser just close the curve for a second and see what we can do with this now with this one what I thought would be more interesting was to play around a little bit with color grading so we haven't done any of that yet this is more kind of being a bit flexible with the uh, the title of the webinar here this is less of a portrait more of an editorial shot but it's still kind of a portrait but there's a couple of te techniques in there which I think is good for all of us to know as well so first of all with this shot 
um, I'm going to rotate it a tiny bit. So I'm going to go to my rotation and flip tool and just shift shift down cursor arrow and that would just move it in 0.1 increments till he's standing a bit straighter. And I'm also going to use the keystone tool because this fence is kind of leaning in a bit and just change the keystone a little bit. Now I wouldn't go too far because obviously that doesn't look very natural. Uh, but just bringing it up a bit kind of elongates him slightly and changes the perspective of the fence a little bit as well. So if we see before and after, it's just made him a little bit taller and so on. And it's not much, just a little bit. Let's grab our crop. I just want to go in a bit tighter, like so, and then see what we can do. And actually, I think I've rotated too much, so I'm going to push him back that way a bit. All right. First of all, white balance wise, it's a bit warm for my liking. Now I'm going into this thinking that I'm gonna color grade it anyway. So maybe I don't have to worry about white balance too much, but it is a little bit off. So I'm just gonna take it down a few points just to cool it slightly. So his t-shirt is kind of a bit more neutral or even to the colder point. Now exposure generally is a little bit down. So his t-shirt I don't really want to get any brighter so again it's probably a case of lifting up the brightness a bit because we want to keep that separation between t-shirt and sky we don't want that to blend into each other because then it's harder to really see what's going on for him so brightness up a little bit looking at our levels tool we've got an absence of data here so I'm going to hit auto in levels and that would just set the shadow and highlight points that would just give us a slightly less flat shot and a bit more contrast. You don't have to do that, but you can see the difference by moving it across. And you can watch the histogram at the top, essentially you're pinching either end of the tonal range and stretching it out. So we get that nice spread from shadow to highlights. So again, you can either hit auto or you can manually set it where you want. And we're still getting a separation in between t-shirt and background, which is important. Um, what else was I going to do with this shot? I can't remember how I edited this. Let's just refresh my memory. Oh, quite a lot of different stuff. Uh, what was the adjustment layer for? That was, oh, that was just to bring up his face a little bit, I think. This one I wouldn't worry too much about skin tone because it's all kind of fairly even and it's editorial shot. So we're not looking up close or really sort of examining those kinds of things. Um, his face is kind of a bit dark ever so slightly. So I just want to lift his face a, li a little bit more. Now I'll do this in a slightly more quick and dirty way because I know I will still get a good result. So I'm going to grab a brush, go over to him, make sure flow is on 100 and just bring that down a bit and just do a pretty rough uh, mask on his face and t-shirt like so. Now it's not super accurate which is often a misconception that everything has to be super tight with you know a very hard edge brush or anything like that but it depends a lot on the adjustment that you're going to do so let's just call this face his face is sitting a little bit in shadow so i just want to open it up a bit more now if i used uh exposure then as my mask is a bit mucky it would kind of brighten up where i've got some overspill as well just around the edges but as I'm going to use brightness, that's only going to affect the midtones, and my highlights are going to be unchanged. So even if I push brightness a lot, notice that it's his skin tone is changing more than my overspill areas. But I only really want to go to sort of that much, like so. And if we turn that on and off, you can see the effect it has. Now on this side of his face, that's sitting in a bit more shadow. So if I want to brighten this side more than the other side, we could have done what I did before by reducing flow and then kind of giving more of the effect on this side to the right hand side. But I'm willing to bet if I bring up the shadows a bit, you see how that's only affecting the darker side and really not doing anything here. So with a little lift of the shadows, we can bring that up. And again, it's not going to affect my overspray because you see there's a little bit of mask here and here, that's not going to be affected because it's not a shadow tone. So it's almost like we've 
got a perfect sort of mask anyway, based on the kind of sliders uh, that we're using. So let's zoom out and see what we did there. Looks pretty good, maybe too bright. So as that's a combination of sliders, I can just bring the opacity down to where I think it's about right. Great, um, let's have a little play with color grading this one. Actually, first of all, if we look at his jeans, they're kind of slipping into a bit too much darkness because I'd probably, if we were editing this, I want this a bit contrast here. But at the expense of losing his jeans, these are, if we look at the RGB numbers, you see these are right at the end of the histogram. And if you look at the little line that's dancing around on the histogram, you see his jeans really are that first peak because that's the darkest part of the shot. So if I want to brighten these up a bit, no need to bother with dodging burning or anything fancy like that. I would open up the black. So if we push this aggressively, you can see it's pretty much targeted to that zone. So I just want a little bit more detail back in there. So I'll bring that up, but I'm still getting a benefit of extra contrast, as you can see as well. And we still got separation around his shoulders. So I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, just as we messed around with exposure a bit, just want to check the levels. So I'm going to bring that back out. Don't want to clip any data just to be on the safe side. Okay, where are we so far? So if we hit before and after, before, after, so cooler and so on. Now this one is going to be a fun one to color grade. So I'm going to make a new field adjustment layer and we call this color grade. Now for color grading, a convenient tool to use is the color balance tool. Let's close our color editor, make this guy a bit smaller. It is the color balance tool. Why? Because it's very simple to use and all of you can kind of figure out how to use it in about 60 seconds flat. So it's very, very simple to use. To use it, as I said, any of you can figure this out. You've got a master tab, which essentially affects the whole shot. So if I just grab the little circle in the center and push it anywhere, this will apply tint over the whole shot. Now to reset it, just double tap anywhere. And the reason why we're doing this on a field layer, again, it's like a mask over the whole shot, is that as well as the color balance tool, we can introduce um, other adjustments as well like saturation, which we do in a second. So as well as the master tab, you've got a three-way tab, which has split the photo up into shadows, midtones, and highlights. So if I just massively pull this in one direction, you can see it's only affecting the shadows. And it rolls off really nicely into the midtones, and the midtones rolls off really nicely in the highlights. Now, if you're not sure where to start with the color balance tool, there's a few handy presets up here, which will just move the little points around to something until you think what looks interesting. So I quite like the look of purple punch and all that's done is set a few adjustments like so. So that's just some free built-in presets so you can explore what color grading does. Uh, we also sell a styles pack called Spectrum which is purely based on color grading and also uses the color editor too. So if you're interested in color grading that's a really good pack uh, to look at as well. Now what you might notice is that as well as the color wheels, it's also changed this slider on the right hand side. So this is like a luminosity change for that, that area. Now that, if I reset this and bring up purple punch again, what that's done is almost sort of counteracted what I wanted to do with seeing a bit more detail here. So what I might do is just open this up a little bit so we don't lose that detail. And the good thing is about having your color grading on a layer is that we can turn it off and on and then we can see what it's doing. And as an additional thing, I'd like more muted tones. So I'm gonna bring the saturation down. We could go black and white, but I'm gonna go in between. So we've got to look like that. And once again, if you think, you know what, I've, I've sent this a little bit too hard, as we say, uh, you can bring the opacity down to go anywhere between your full color grade and something different. So you've always got that opacity slider as well. Something that's annoying me on this shot is this kind of cable. So we're gonna grab our healing brush, make this a bit bigger, and we're just gonna draw 
along here. See what Capture One does. Now it's just picked a point here. I just want to move that across a bit because it was just kind of picking out a bit of his gene uh, as well. Now in actual fact, I think I've probably gone slightly too far. So we're, oh, not too bad. So if I grab my eraser with a hard edge, make it a bit smaller, then I can just take out this spot. There we go, looks a bit more believable, doesn't it? So going back to Steve's question, again, healing is on a separate layer because all the color grading, exposure adjustments, you name it, then follows through with it. So I never have to redo that healing point again. A little change of the crop, it's a bit too tall for me, just thinking, and there we go. So before and after, before and after tool won't show composition changes. So that's how it came out of camera and that's how with our tweaks. Uh, with our layers, we had our face, which was conveniently done with the aid of a few clever sliders, and of course our color grade as well, like so. Now, if we wanna see a true before and after, what we can do is make a new variant. So that will give us a virtual copy of the shot, like so, and then we can put this guy and this guy side by side. So before on the right, you can probably guess, and after on the left-hand side. Okay, let's have a look at some questions. Um, let's see, reading, reading, reading. Um, good question from Ellis, but I don't know the answer. So what's the most convenient way of uh, composing uh, different adjustments uh, to various different skin tones with a large group of people? Well, I think the best way to do that is if you have you know, a bunch of shots up on screen. Once you finish the shot, then don't forget you can always edit in Capture One in a multi-view mode. So if you're trying to tell a story of various different, you know, photos and things, like if I just select everything, then of course you can look through the bank of shots and just decide, okay, in this story, this one is a little bit too dark, so I'm gonna brighten this one and so on. So don't forget about the multi-view mode. It can be uh, very, very useful. Uh, let's check questions in the webinar room. Um, we answered that question, I think, just talking to myself. Uh, Bob says, if you wanted Nev in monochrome, would you convert first or after adjustment? I would do it fairly early on in the process, purely because adjustments to contrast and so on might not fit with your black and white adjustment, but sometimes we can get lucky pretty good out of the bat, but I would do my black and white conversion fairly uh, early on in the process. Uh, let's see, two options of that. Is there a way to know which crop has been applied to an image? No, it does not. So you, you can see the uh, dimensions, so the size of the crop based on the currently selected process recipe. So you're gonna see a change there, but you won't know the actual um, aspect ratio. That's the word I was looking for. So unfortunately not, no, but it's, uh, it's a good idea. Uh, Gabrielle, great question. Is there any way to copy from one image and paste to another skipping the cropping attribute? That is the default behavior. So if that's not happening for you, you may well have changed something. So in the adjustments clipboard, if I hit copy, so right now you can see it's copying composition, crop, everything. So let's deselect everything. So if you go into auto select and say adjusted except composition, then it will do everything that you desire, Gabrielle. So now if I say copy, it's copied everything except for composition is left blank. So in the adjustments clipboard tool, just look for auto select. That's the default behavior. Uh, so you may well have changed it or you could be running a much older version of Capture One that doesn't have that option. I think we added it in possibly Capture One 12, I think, or maybe it was 20. I don't remember. If you're not on 20, now's a good time to buy as it's 25% uh, off currently at the moment. Uh, if you look uh, at the top, if you're in the webinar room, there's a discount code for anyone else watching. It's take 25 off at the checkout. Uh, 
So now's a good time to buy if you're not on Capture 112. But that's the way to do it, uh, Gabriel. Uh, okay, let's, how are we doing for time? Wow, I'm much slower this morning. So we've done three. We've done Emily's, two Emily's, and we've done uh, Russell Ord's shot here. So let's see if we can squeeze one more in quickly, and then we'll have a look at uh, the last couple uh, where, where we can just see quick before and afters. Okay, so let's take Alex's shot. I think this is already edited. So let's make a new variant. So we're back to square one. Again, this shot doesn't take much, but it's, it's a good example of what the black slider can do if you wanna bump up contrast, but not mess up your highlights. So first of all, we're gonna grab a crop and we're just gonna crop a bit tighter, like so. A quick tip, if you are cropping to a specific uh, aspect ratio, right click with your mouse or pen, then that brings you up a little quick view of the crop tool. So if I thought, you know what, this needs to be two by three, right click, and then you can pick your aspect ratio straight away. So it's just like a, a really fast way to view cropping options. So there's our crop. Someone asked if these were actual real glasses, and they are, because you can cleverly, someone said, look, you can see the distortion of, that, of her uh, skin there. So Alex, my colleague who shot this, just lit it particularly well, and there's no glare whatsoever on her glasses, so good job, Alex. Um, first of all, for this one, exposure is kind of okay, but maybe a little on the dark side. So again, I'm just gonna lift up the brightness ever so slightly and add a bit of contrast. But I don't wanna go too hard with the contrast because now this does not look good. So let's reset the double click to reset the contrast. But what we can do is take our black slider. And if I pull this down, this works really nice on this shot because it just brings down those, those darker tones. Obviously I wouldn't go that far but it brings down those darker tones, gives the contrast a nice little boost, but without affecting those highlights at all. And we could probably bring shadows down a touch as well. Um, this eye is kind of slightly darker than this eye by a tiny amount. So if I wanted to quickly brighten this up, what I would do, I wouldn't just draw a mask here and draw a mask there because I want to kind of balance the two eyes if you like. So I would start with a field adjustment layer. So that's over the whole shot. And then let's go for, I can't remember your name, sir, but who suggested using curves. So we want to kind of bump up our shadow to mid-tones. So I would use a Luma curve because that will keep the color stable. And then we could make a curve that looks something like that. So that's just brightening up the area in our eyes like so. So it's a specific curve just for that tonal range. So now let's make sure we call this eyeballs and right click and say clear mask. And now we can grab our brush, make it nice and soft, nice low flow, because now I can just brush in here and brighten this up. And then this one will probably need less. Kind of doing the weird distance look away from the monitor just hide the browser. So that's a little touch there. And then if we wanted to do more in the whites of the eyes, then we could just make our brush smaller and lighten that up a touch as well. So if we look at our grayscale mask, now you, so it's ever so slightly brighter in the middle. This one is a little bit brighter than, than the right hand side. So that allowed us to balance it quite nicely. Again, if it's too much, we could bring our opacity down so I'd say somewhere around there is kind of nice. So that's also a good use of picking up flow as well. So if we turn this on and off, we can see the difference. So it's subtle, but that's what it's all about, like so. So uh, again, a really good example of where flow is useful. And if you've gone too far on one particular side, then you could use your eraser brush also on a low flow, just to knock it back. Okay, a couple of other things. I found the holes in a sweater here kind of a bit distracting. Maybe that sounds weird, but as there was kind of three in a group, I just thought that it's kind of stood out a bit too much. So in this way, 
Maker is just a simple way to get rid of them. Um, we can use exactly the same heel layer just to do a few little bits and pieces here as well. Um, if you don't like these arrows popping up, I find them useful because then I can always keep an eye on where the source point is. But if you right click, you can turn them off. You can also set that on a shortcut. So if you want to quickly be able to turn those arrows on and off, then make yourself uh, a shortcut for that as well. Now this is shot on a 60 megapixel camera, so it's kind of unkind to like Nev with 100 pixels, um, and Sophie here is now battling with 60 megapixels, so apologies to Anne Sophie. But you get the idea with uh, spotting. What's also nice for portraits is uh, to apply, if you feel like it, some film grain. So if we bring up the film grain tool and just zoom in a bit, all these film grain simulations are very much based on analog film. Someone asked this morning, which is the best analog representation? All of them are. Uh, what you might find with um, other applications trying to emulate film grain is that simply it has just a scan of film grain kind of slapped on top of the picture. Uh, but that's not really how film grain works in the real world. Depending on the underlying image, whether it's shadows, midtones, highlights, then the grain structure varies in its shape and density and so on. So Capture One will give you a really nice uh, natural way to work with grain. So I'm going to go for some cubic grain. Impact is really like an opacity slider, so how obvious is the grain compared to the shot. And granularity, you can probably guess, is how grainy it is. But it gives us a lovely, super nice uh, grain pattern, as you can see. So if I just temporarily reset this before and after, just looks you know wonderful. It's the closest film grain representation you can get. And I can say that confidently as well. So if we turn on before and after, there's before and after. Let's zoom out a little bit as you can see. So that's all we did. Again, not a huge amount, but just little subtle tweaks. Now it did come up. I love the look of the film grain, or it does come up, but I don't want to put it on my raw file because I'm gonna round trip to Photoshop and do retouching, liquify, you know, more extensive retouching that, that you wouldn't do in Capture One and so on. No problem, because there's no reason why you can't grab a TIFF file so here's one from good friend of the house, uh, Brandy Nicole, self-portrait. So this is her finalized TIFF. Uh, there is the outer camera Nikon, so pretty much close to how it came out of camera, a bit less contrast and so on. Gone into Photoshop, done what she needs to do. There's no reason why we can't also put, let's go for tabular grain. No reason why we can't also put grain on a TIFF file works just as well. So just consider that if you're round tripping from Capture One to Photoshop or Affinity Photo, uh, something like that, uh, then there's no reason why you can't do so. Okay, how are we doing for time? Out of time almost. So unfortunately, can't quite get to the last shot, but just to give you an idea, um, this is from Michelle Conop. That's actually another self-portrait. We've been doing a lot of portraits over Instagram over the past couple of weeks and featuring uh, your photos. Um, what did I do for this shot? Let's just run through the layers. Again, if you don't lay, name your layers, you've got no idea what they're doing. So adjustment layer number one, that appears to be a radial mask, I think. Yep, it's a radial mask, which is dynamic, so we can always adjust it. And that's just got a correction on the, helps if you're on the right tool set, David. Uh, reducing the blacks, just so we get a nice rich dark background and bringing the brightness down as well. So if we turn that layer on and off, you can see it's quite a dramatic adjustment. But I thought this looked sort of Hollywood spotlight kind of look, so I just wanted to isolate Michelle. And then this layer, What's this one doing? Again, always name your layers. If we look at our grayscale, we can see it's just a, oh, that was it, it was just um, a dodge. So just to lift the exposure a little bit just around the face, and you can see it's more subtle on the face and a little bit more on the hair because my radial mask 
kind of took too much out of the background. So that just lightens up those areas a little bit like so. And then obviously it's in black and white. And also I put some grain on this one as well. So if we look at the grain, a nice chunky bit of tabular grain. So once again, using similar techniques to what we did before, but this time with a black and white conversion and then dodging and burning and so on. Cool, uh, all right, so let's finish uh, by having a look at um, the last few questions. Brain died again then, sorry. Um, let's see, I find Lena was saying, I find that black and white images done with film always look better to me than black and white done via post-production on a digital image. Is that something Capture One can make a more genuine black and white look? I think the black and white tools work great uh, in Capture One. So it's not just a simple convert to black and white, or you can see Michelle in color. Actually looks really nice in color as well. But you can see in the black and white here, you've got the ability to adjust the different tonal ranges too. So obviously with the reds, that's gonna affect the skin tone, Michelle's hair and so on. So you've got a whole bank of adjustment there. You've also got curves, clarity, structure. So I personally think you can do a really nice job of converting to black and white in Capture One, but just give it um, a try. Um, let's just scroll up a little bit. Sorry if we didn't get to all of your questions. There is lots of you today, um, but don't forget, you know, this is not your only resource of Capture One. We've got the learning hub, learn.captureone.com. Uh, we've got the YouTube channel. Everything is nicely categorized. So uh, Oliver, if you want to know about process recipes, I would watch the five minute tutorial on that and that should sort you out as well. Um, do, 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 do. Can you have different brush characteristics in the same layer? Yeah, absolutely. So again, if we look at the, the layer here, for example, so if we just grab our brush, let's just turn off the mask. So if we grab our brush, then I can just merrily adjust flow, size, hardness, opacity over the same layer. So again, looking at the grayscale, you can see flow is relatively low here. I must have brushed a bit more there to have more of that effect. And then the halo on the hair is kind of more here compared to there. So you can mess around with your brush to uh, heart's content. Really, if you think of the concept of layers, it's just, you're creating a mask which can be built in a whole range of different ways with a brush, with a radial mask, with a linear, with luminosity, with the color editor can make you a mask. And then it's those adjustments uh, put uh, on that mask as well. So let's just bring up our stars of the day just to put them on screen. Here look, we can do a multiple before and after so you can see just set that like that as we look at some more questions uh, so yes Alan you definitely can um, mm, mm, mm. yeah Anthony you can change tones in black and white with white balance you can use the uh, color balance tool as well there's just there's so many different ways you can manipulate black and white that you should be able to get yourself uh, a very nice result I'm um, just scrolling up through uh, the future. Uh, Ellis says, how do we submit photos for future webinars? Uh, occasionally we do a webinar where we take your shots and we haven't done one of those for a while. Uh, so we could easily do that again. These photos are just kind of from friends of the house that I've begged, borrowed uh, and stolen as well. Um, Charlie, that kind of happens automatically to have a grain style which you can change the grain size based on highlight shadow. So yes, you can't control that yourself, but there is some of that underlying work going on in Capture One too, which just makes the grain look nice and natural. All right, let's pick two more questions and let's see. Um, that was a very long question, so I don't have time to read that. Um, Ken was asking, does the code work on monthly or for outright? Check on the website, it does tell you exactly what the code is applicable for. Ken is talking about the take 25 off code. 
I can't remember myself, but maybe one of my colleagues can step in and let us know it as well. There we go, Rajesh has done it for us. Take 25 off. Um, but the website will tell you how it works for a subscription or the outright price too. Okay, um, I think that kind of wraps everything up for today. Uh, this was going straight to YouTube, so it will be on there to watch uh, at your leisure as soon as we stop this uh, transmission. And uh, don't forget to sign up for future webinars. Uh, there probably isn't any showing on the Learning Hub right now. That's where we always post our webinars. But there will be more coming up over the summer as well. Uh, so let's see how we go. And also a couple of quick lives next week too. And you can always keep an eye on our Facebook page for events that are coming up as well. All right, thanks for joining us again today. I hope that was useful. Uh, thanks to uh, Emily Teague for her photos and Russell Lord in Australia for his photo. Uh, Alex, my colleague in Copenhagen for his photo. And of course, uh, Michelle here for her selfie as well. So thanks to everyone for contributing and take care. Have a great rest of Thursday and see you soon. Bye now.